Hi, Josh. How are you? Yeah, not bad at all. How are you? Very good. Thanks. Very good. Well, it's great to have the chance to have a more proper conversation. It feels like I, I know you already. You've been very helpful to me on this sort of amateur sentientism journey, thinking about the history and the context of sentientism and the term and its use in academic circles. You've obviously been on our sentientism Facebook group for a long while now, and you were one of the earliest people to join our I'm a sentientist wall as well. So it's, it's great to finally have the chance to have a proper conversation. Uh, so thanks yeah, for making the time. Be. And as you know, the, c- the context of these conversations are really about what I see as the two deepest philosophical questions, what's real and what matters morally. And I'm in a slightly, but obviously biased way, setting it in the context of my attempt at reframing sentientism as a very pluralistic, broad worldview that says, when it comes to what's real, we should take a naturalistic approach that we engage with the reality as we find it, using evidence and reason and forming provisional and probabilistic beliefs, uh, but maintaining humility and being open-minded in the best interpretation, I guess, if you like, of a scientific worldview. And when it comes to what matters, the obvious answer is obvious. It's in the name is what I guess our scope of moral consideration and our compassion should be extended to all sentient beings. So any being that has the capacity for experience to suffer, to flourish and to feel things without exception. But I'm having, I'm talking to people who both agree with and disagree with aspects of that philosophy or the whole thing. So it'll be fascinating to understand your sort of personal journey, where you've got to now and how your work fits into some of those themes, because it's highly relevant. Uh, But before we get onto those two central questions, how would you best introduce yourself and your work for people who don't know you already. My name's Josh. I'm a philosopher by training, although for the last few years I've actually worked in politics departments. So I'm currently a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Sheffield, which is a bit of a mouthful for a title. But I'm a philosopher interested in animals, human-animal relationships. I've got particular interests in food. And just generally, I'm interested in addressing moral, political, legal questions, established moral, political, legal questions, but asking where animals fit into them. How can we change the dialogue? How can we reapply old theories and old ideas by including animals in them? And I'm also an advocate of a kind of multidisciplinary approach to animals in in animal studies. So although my background's in philosophy and I'm now in politics, I've done a bit of work with or alongside scholars in other disciplines as well, because I think that it's important for academics from a range of different backgrounds who are addressing questions about animals to have a kind of a place to call home that isn't just their kind of the the discipline or the department where they did their kind of original training. So I think that something like animal studies has big potential in that area. Yeah, I agree. And I I love both of those approaches. One, because it's just a really interesting thought experiment to take, I guess, a lot of the positive ethical development we've done as a species around, you know, universal human rights or universal compassion to humans and challenging various forms of discrimination and just saying, why can't we do that for all sentient beings? Why can't we incorporate animals into that way of thinking? It's not always that simple, but remarkably often it is, but we'll come back to that theme. But I also love the interdisciplinary approach as well. And that's one of the um, advantages I have of being a total amateur is I can dip into the, these different fields. So I've been lucky to in- interview people with focused on psychology or sociology or politics or some more technical questions and business and NGOs and activism and spanning all of those spaces. But also different domains of knowledge themselves can be really interesting. So you're talking to people who are studying consciousness, people who are studying artificial intelligence and thereby consciousness and what sentience really is. Of course, the entire fields of biology and neurophysiology and human ethics as well. So yeah, it's fascinating to connect the dots. And I think each of those lines of inquiry is more productive if they're at least aware of all of the other rich work that's going on around them. And when it comes to it, if I don't want to start lecturing, but when we want to affect change, I think you have to be aware of and be able to pull all of those different levers if you really want to make change happen. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that they do have different things to offer. And there are challenges brought by this kind of interdisciplinary conversation. Mm. Um, sometimes people have it to talk across each other. So there might be particular terms or particular ideas that make sense in one context, but means to be quite different in another 
another. Mm. And that can be a real challenge. And the other challenge is simply the fact of knowing where to make these links, because it's a feature of kind of modern academic research and academic life and academic career pathways that people often end up very siloed and without wanting to pick on any particular discipline, because I don't think there is any particular discipline that's particularly guilty of this. It's something that's everywhere. But you might find that people in English literature, for example, are asking questions that are really interesting to philosophers and the English literature scholars just don't know each other. At the same time, the people in English literature might be grappling with problems that they're thinking, how do we go about solving these without realising that philosophers have been working on this for literally decades? Yeah. And I guess that same point can be made about animal ethics compared to human ethics. right? Yeah. As much and as environmental ethics too. Them. Exactly. So we don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel, exactly what you're just saying. It's sometimes the case that when we encounter a problem in animal ethics, we can actually find that there's already a whole host of kind of resources that we can tap into and draw upon from established practice or theory in ethics or politics or law in relation to humans relating to each other. So I think that of course, you can't, nobody can know everything, but it can be helpful if people know where to look to find the kinds of things that might be helpful in dealing with the problems that they're dealing with. Yeah, agree. And I think we'll come back to those themes in the final part of the conversation uh, as well. So the first of those two qu- questions I like to ask is that sort of super basic one. And I feel almost embarrassed doing this when I'm talking to professional philosophers, but I, I summarise it as what's real. So for many people, that's a story about whether they grew up in a naturalistic or an atheistic sort of scientific-minded household and society, or one that was more spiritual and um, religious or transcendent, and how that tone was set about what is the nature of the universe and how does it all fit together, and, and how their philosophy has shifted over time, if it has, and where they're up to now. So it would be great to know your personal story on that journey. You can wind the clock back as far as you like. Yeah, that's, this is a, it's a fascinating question because there's so many different ways we could approach this question. But I've listened into a lot of these podcasts where people have talked about, their, their, as you say, their own personal story, and I'd be mm. happy to share some thoughts in that regard. I wasn't raised in a religious environment, but then I wasn't really raised in a kind of atheistic environment either. I was exposed as a child to a lot of different religious traditions. I grew up in rural Northwest England. There wasn't a huge variety of uh, religious traditions around (laughs) me, but you know, I I did encounter uh, various different things. I do have a distinct memory. I will have been about eight um, Mm. years old, something like that, of coming into a classroom at primary school and seeing the story of Noah's Ark written on the board and just having this more, I thought, I don't believe that. I don't think that happened. And genuinely, that is a kind of formative memory in the sense that after that, I feel that I never quite connected with religious understandings of the world. Yeah. My best friend for a long time was very religious, so I went to a lot of church events with him. He's still working in the church actually mm. now, so shout out to Dan Randall if he's listening. <laughs> Hello, Dan. Um, and I remained engaging with religious ideas for a lot of years. I studied religious studies right up to undergraduate level. Oh, all right. Um, though, mm as a kind of minor while I was doing my philosophy, Mm. but I did a lot of religious philosophy while doing the philosophy degree. But for a long time as a teenager, I was pretty militantly atheist. I guess you would put me in the kind of new atheist category with people like like Dawkins. I've left that behind, I suppose. I think there are problems with the the way that that worldview tends to operate, Mm. not least, I think, because of the dominance that it it can place in certain narrow understandings of scientific reality. Yeah, yeah. Because I think when you're asking this question of what is real, you've got to distinguish between the question of what is real and what we can know to be real. Yeah. So these are actually two separate questions. Agree. So and ho- hopefully they're correlated, <laughs> but I agree. They're distinct things, yeah. Yeah. So my, my conviction, and I guess this is a conviction, that there is a real world out there is a slightly different conviction from a conviction which I don't have, which is that we know all about the real world. Yes. I think it would, of course, be yeah. uh, foolish to think that we know all about the real world. Yeah. But we've got to, we've got to recognise that science as practised is making every effort to understand the real world but it would be naive to think that scientists or that we, through certain scientific methodologies, have a kind of unadulterated access to reality. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's partly why I prefer to talk a natural, about a naturalistic way of viewing the world than a scientific one. I do think there's a, obviously a very strong overlap, and science at its best it 
has doubt and humility and error correction and probabilistic belief at its heart. That's the way it really should operate so that any good scientist shouldn't be 100% sure of anything, right? Outside of a formal system where you've defined it in such a way that you can define mathematical proof. In terms of real world understanding, there shouldn't really ever be 100% knowledge. But the tone that some of the new atheists and some scientists can give off in their communications and their style, sometimes as a reaction to a supernatural way of thinking can itself come across as overconfident, dogmatic, strident, and almost as you can feel that same sort of flavor, right? Like where is the humility that is at the core of a naturalistic worldview? So again, that's been a common theme through quite a few of these conversations has been, and I I guess I follow that path as well, you know, come out of some sort of religious context, go through a bit of an anti-religious or angry atheist phase, and then it softens. And and for, for myself, that hasn't softened in that I've still remained realistically open to there being some sort of transcendent supernatural stuff out there. I still have a super hard edged naturalistic way of thinking that just says I'm radically open-minded, but I will withhold belief until I see decent quality evidence. But the tone of humility and recognizing that humility is the most important thing about a scientific or a naturalistic worldview is I think really important. It's really important to set that example in tone, not just in, in fact, but yeah. So it's interesting you've followed a similar path. I think it's really useful as well at this point to bring in morality, because I'm inclined to think about morality in a very similar kind of way, Mm. in that I'm a moral realist. I think that there are right and wrong claims in morality. I think that there are, I'm not going to use the T word, but I think that sometimes people get morality wrong and sometimes people get morality. I think people are often quite confronted by that view, especially people from a very kind of scientific background can be quite confronted by that view because they say, show me the evidence. And of course, the problem is that there'd be a different kind of evidence and a different kind of argument. In the same way, we might not ask. A scientist asking for scientific proof of morality is a bit like an art historian asking for art historical proof of like medical claims. Yeah. It's the wrong yeah. kind of claim. Yeah. It's the wrong kind of evidence. But I think that sometimes people will say to me things like, oh, so you think that there's moral truth. How do you know that your claim is the correct one? I say, well, actually, you're confusing two different questions here. One is the kind of meta-ethical question about what is real in relation to morality or or in relation to justice or what it might be. And the other one is the the more practical question, the moral question about, well, are there facts? And then what are those facts? And those are two different kinds of questions. And again, different kinds of evidence are needed for them. So I'm not a meta-ethicist. Although I am a moral realist, I don't necessarily have, I'm not necessarily the right person to ask for arguments that there is some such thing as moral truth. But I am an ethicist and I am a political philosopher, and I do think that there are good reasons to think that if there is moral truth, it's going to look more like that than like that, for example. Yeah, that makes sense. And and it it seems fair to say that given you don't have a supernatural worldview, that's not a foundation for your ethics. So one of the reasons some people are hesitant about moving away from a supernatural or religious worldview is because they're worried they'll lose any moral foundation whatsoever. And so so some people will cling on to it, even if they're not comfortable with it, because it has the commandments or the Quran or Mm -hmm. deity that will judge you. And of course, there's much good in those moral ways of thinking. There's rich veins of compassion, but there's also some bloody awful stuff, frankly, as well. And fortunately, most religions are working through that process of cherry picking. But but for the people who do, okay, there isn't a supernatural worldview. There's still a bunch of different paths they can follow. And one is the moral realist approach where you say, look, moral truths do still exist in a meaningful way. And it's a a question of, you know, again, with humility and uncertainty, exploring and trying to work out what those might be and applying them. Other people will because they feel like they've lost some sort of objective moral foundation and they can't bring themselves to think there are objective moral truths, will almost go down what I think of as a very insidious sort of morally relativistic approach where they say, and you can see how this flows from a scientific worldview to some degree. We just evolved A, we negotiate stuff to cooperate, but also to compete. And so whatever one group defines as being morally good, then who are we to judge that group? And I think that can lead to some really bleak, dark places, because I think where you and I would agree is that there are some things that are just morally wrong and are morally less wrong. So the, and I don't know if this is even, because I, I'm only a pretend philosopher, but the, I guess the resolution I find is that I don't describe myself as a moral realist in the sort of pure platonic sense that there are moral yeah. truths floating out there somewhere to be explored. And in a sense, if we imagine the universe before any sentient beings existed at all, like, I don't know, pre-Cambrian or whatever, we think sentience evolved. If you imagine that universe, 
I don't think morally ex- mor- morality existed then at all, except as a mm. conditional concept, if you were thinking about the potential. So in a sense, I don't think I'm a, not a moral realist in the sense that a universe with no sentient beings, I think th- there are no moral truths, there's no morality. Right? So in that sense, I do think it is something that non-human animals millions of years ago constructed through evolution and DNA and learned behavior and kin selection and reciprocity and so on. And that we as uh, the human species also construct using those evolutionary bases, but also through just luck, having the sort of cognitive ability to work out this stuff I want that isn't directly driven by my genes wanting to propagate There's things that I want as a sentient being as well. So in a sense, it's constructed, but it's not constructed arbitrarily. Right? It's not just you know, what I like at this moment, it's grounded, but not in a sort of perfect platonic moral realism. It's grounded in a naturalistic understanding of what sentient beings are, the nature of sentience. And again, to your earlier point, we don't have perfect understanding of these things and may never understand them perfectly, but it's based on a naturalistic understanding of what sentient beings are, the nature of sentience. And in a ridiculously simplistic way of thinking, I don't like suffering. I'm pretty sure you don't either. And we call the choice to care about that morality. So in the sense that if someone says, okay, but why should I care about the suffering of others? That is just, to my mind, asking, why should I be moral? And in a way, the answer is, you don't have to, but hopefully the rest of us will constrain you because... (laughs) So I don't know if that... But that's how I find that sort of resolution. Maybe it's like a weak moral realism, which is still grounded in a naturalistic understanding of what it means to be a sentient being. But I don't well, know, that's, that's where it. I've got to amateurishly. I hear you. And again, I should stress that I am not a metaethicist. <laughs> yeah. um, I agree with you that in many ways, a kind of moral relativism is the worry. That's what I'm trying to resist. And so there are a range of ways of resisting that manage not to be relativistic or nihilistic and manage not to be grounded in a supernatural being of some sort. And there there are a range of ways of doing that. And I'm somewhere in that cluster. So I I tend to call myself a moral realist, maybe weak moral realist would be a good one. (laughs) Constructivist is a different thing, but part of that same family in that it is rejecting relativism or nihilism, and it's rejecting the supernatural, but it's retaining a strong focus on doing the right kind of thing. And no doubt, as I'm saying these things, there are certain meta-ethicists who are shivering um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, because I'm, I'm conflating a lot of different kinds of yeah. Uh, yeah. problems and puzzles. But I guess the, the important point is that we want to be in a position where we can say there are some things that are right and wrong without yeah. having to rely upon the, these problematic foundations. Yeah, I agree. And and that brings me back to fairly common sense statements like needlessly causing suffering and death to a sentient being is a morally negative thing to do. Of course, there might be justifications, there might be trading interests off, but in isolation, I don't like suffering. So needlessly causing it to someone would be negative. But again, like you say, there's this, maybe this amorphous cloud of approaches, and I'm probably using the terms wrong as well, but that sits in that middle space that I think feels like the right place to be, but let's see. But one of the one of the other interesting things I'm interested in exploring in this sort of context of what is our morality grounded on, if it's grounded on anything, and I think it's a question that, as an amateur, when I look at the field of moral philosophy as a whole, seems weirdly neglected by most philosophers seem to, I might be being a little bit unfair here, but most moral philosophers seem to write and think on the tacit assumption that only humans are moral subjects and patients. And the question, the fundamental question of moral considerability, right, which entities matter, seems to me to be something that is deeply important and we've got so much work to do. How did you go through that journey of thinking about which entities matter morally, which entities warrant compassion, which types of things, which types of entities deserve moral consideration and How has that shifted over your life as well? Yeah, that's great. That's such an interesting, important question. I I remember reading Peter Singer's work as probably a kind of 17-year-old, something like that. Mm. So uh, this was when I was um, doing my A-levels, or a high schooler would be another way of putting it. I'm assuming you grew up in a normal family that just 
you know, consumed animal products and maybe have pets oh, yeah, and yeah. so on and just the default. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, absolutely. So I grew up eating meat. I grew up, I remember as a kid being confronted by vegetarianism and being very resistant to it, as a lot of people are, the kind of knee-jerk reaction. What, what do you think uh, that was? Because it was a challenge to me. It was a fundamental challenge to what I took for granted and being a kind of thoughtful, but at the same time, argumentative child. Hence the career in philosophy. I, Oh, quite. It's probably a professional hazard, isn't it? I was confronted by this and I thought, well, I need to justify what I'm doing rather than taking the response, which I should have taken, which was change what I'm doing. It took me many years to change what I was doing. And it was when I encountered these kind of rigorous philosophical arguments, when I was just starting to look into uh, possibly studying philosophy at, at a university level, because here in the UK, it's not something that's available for the most part to teenagers studying GCSEs or A-levels. My encounters with it had been through, as I was suggesting earlier, religious studies. Which, and as I'm sure of all people, the kind of philosophy you encounter through something like religious studies is not philosophy as I would understand it yeah. Um, yeah. now. So when thinking about non-humans, it would have been dominion, stewardship, do, do non-humans have souls, that type of stuff, if it came up, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And while there were ethical questions raised, they were the typical ethical questions of religious ethics. So yeah. questions like abortion and euthanasia, which yeah. are of course important, worthwhile questions and definitely questions we should be considering. And as a little added point, something we should perhaps be considering while thinking about non-human animals as well. Yes. There's really interesting links between these things. But animals were not necessarily something I encountered. So it was through encountering the philosophical arguments that I started to change my, my views about these things. And I guess I am, the, I am the fairly typical example of someone who was a meat eater and then read the arguments and went, actually, I want to change now. And one of the interesting things about this is that's the experience of quite a lot of philosophers. And that's why I think philosophers are sometimes not the best activists. And the reason for that is yeah. we have been, we've had our eyes opened I was going to say converted them, but that's a problematically religious term. <laughs> uh, we have had our eyes open in a very particular kind of way. And that's not necessarily a way that's going to work for lots of other people. Yeah, Because of the way I think and the way I look at the world, I'm open to philosophical argument and I try to let philosophical argument change me when it is compelling philosophical argument. Now, of course, that might work easier in theory than in practice, but that's a whole other issue. But that's not necessarily how lots of people approach the world. And so it's not necessarily the most effective way to help people come round to your way of thinking. Yeah, um, It can be, but it's not always. And I spoke to the amazing activist and TV broadcaster and author, Jane Velez Mitchell, a couple of days ago. I haven't released the podcast yet, but she said something which I thought was captured that crisply, which is, if you're an activist, you are already not representative of your audience, mm. just by nature of the fact that you've taken this journey a particular way. And it does present exactly that challenge, right? Because we have this disconnect between when you see things like, for example, animal farming and fishing, the way you and I see them, it's very natural, as I'm sure anyone who fights the big fights of human rights feels this sense of righteousness and opprobrium and injustice. And that leads to a default tone of engagement that does work with some people. It absolutely does. Shame and pressure and argument can work, but not fast enough. I think most people, in a similar way that you uh, pushed back and I pushed back on vegetarianism and veganism is not necessarily that, that effective, understandable as it might be. But th there's something I wanted to challenge in what you said, because w one of my pet peeves is I try and be part of sentientism is universal compassion, right? So that includes mm. being compassionate for the people we disagree with, which I need mm. to remind myself when I'm getting snarky on Twitter occasionally. But I, I remember my own journey and how long it took me to see the things I've seen. And I remind myself that it's not complete either. There's no per state of perfection anyone achieves here either, right? But remembering my prior self helps me have compassion for people that still don't see these things or aren't willing to make the changes, and particularly because most people are, they're busy, they have pressures on their lives, they have work, they have family, they have you know, many different struggles, particularly if you think globally. So it's hard to expect people, people to do the really hard moral work of thinking these things through and then challenging and changing something that societally and practically might feel you know, and emotionally like a really difficult change to make, however obvious it is to you and me. So I feel like compassion imperfectly, but I feel that compassion to the average person on the street. If you, I struggle to feel that compassion for moral philosophers or public intellectuals or high profile humanists, for example, who by definition are committed already to a philosophically rigorous, careful, compassionate way of thinking. 
but still have a scope of moral consideration that is strictly constrained to the human species. And I don't know how much you see that. I mean, I've, uh, or whether you share that frustration, because I've, I've seen some of the research around moral philosophers indicating that they're not much more moral than anyone else either. So they might have the skills and arguments to write amazing papers, but the degree to which they actually apply it to their own ethical choices seems questionable. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think this is fascinating. And this is something that I spent a bit of time thinking about because this relates to the question of the role of moral philosophers outside of the academy. Yeah. Right? There's a very narrow sense that moral political philosophers, ethicists of all kinds, just do their work and they publish and they teach and that sort of thing. But then there's also this question of if we are people who are doing the best work, supposedly, mm. on what on how society could be better, what a good society would look like, then we seem to have a role in public uh, discourse that goes beyond just writing a few articles and a few books and teaching 20 undergrads, right? Yeah. This is this seems to have some other kind of role. And a lot of philosophers, I do partake in these other roles in kind of advisory capacities in certain senses. And yes, I have puzzled over these sorts of questions. So we may have seen the same stats, but there, there was one experimental study of philosophers that found that philosophers on the whole were more inclined to say that meat eating was ethically deeply problematic, mm. but they weren't particularly more inclined to be yeah. vegan or vegetarian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, once accounting for the fact that they were middle class educated people, for example, which is it's tied nice. to vegetarians and veganism. So I agree with you that this is a challenge. And one puzzle that I've asked, I'm not necessarily going to answer this right now because I'm not sure that I have a good answer, is that there are two kinds of people, or two extremes perhaps, that I encounter. And you encounter them in day-to-day life, but you also encounter them in, in an academic context who both seem to get it wrong, but in quite different ways. So one set of people says something like, yes, you're absolutely right. The things we do to animals are atrocious. Yes, we need to protect them with rights. Yes, uh, we should all be vegan, but nonetheless, at the same time, they eat meat. Mm -hmm. They might be conflicted about it, and that's something, that's a starting point. But they might just say, look, this is right as an intellectual matter, but that's a different thing from me actually changing my habits. And as you were saying before, it's very hard to know what to say to someone like this. But then at the other extreme, you've got people who just don't get it. They just do not see what it is that uh, the problem is. And you'll say, well, suffering is bad. And they'll say, yeah, suffering is bad. And you'll say, well, animals are suffering for this without any good reason. These very straightforward arguments that mm-hmm. you, you can encounter in all kinds of places. But you don't have to get into the, the deep, complex arguments that you and I might spend some of our time reading yeah. and engaging in to, to present the straightforward case for why people should be vegan or vegetarian. Yet, nonetheless, there are certain people who just don't see it. And, and you get that in both the academic context and the yeah. non-academic context. And so I I spent some time without coming to any conclusion wondering which of these people is the real kind of problem here? Is it the people who get it but won't act? Or is it the people who, for just no obvious reason, just don't get it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I think part partly that's partly why so many of my guests have come to the answer, which is look. We need to keep the moral argument and the pressure and the challenge there, but ultimately we've got to find ways of just making this super easy and and oh, straightforward yeah. for people to, you know, change the behaviour and we'll come to the ethics later on. And that's a constant theme that comes through. If we can make the alternatives fast, cheap, easy, available, socially acceptable, then you know maybe we can help people extract themselves from this these types of systems. And once they're free of them, maybe they'll have a chance to upgrade their ethics in line. So that that seems to be one theme that comes through. And that's something that I'm exploring in a very big way in my current work. Mm. So my postdoc project at Sheffield is called uh, Feeding the World Respectfully, uh, Food Justice and Animals, Feeding the World Respectfully. And the whole idea behind this, here's my one line summary, which uh, I think will be potentially quite shocking. Imagine animals have rights. What would the food system look like? How would we feed the world if animals have rights and everyone Mm. recognised that? My claim is that it wouldn't be a vegan food system. And the reason I say it wouldn't be a vegan food system is because I'm extremely excited about these possible edge cases, these ways that we could source animal products without violating animals' rights. Mm. So the most kind of blatant example of this would be something like in vitro meat, cellular agriculture more broadly. Now, there's a whole host of ethical questions about in vitro meat, which is why this is something worth doing a research project on. But in the abstract, at least, we can see that this is a way that we could have meat and 
respect animals, or as I've put it sometimes, have our cow and eat her. So this is a way that we could respect animal rights without having to change our practices in a massive way. There are other examples as well, but let's just run with in vitro meat as a kind of starting point. So exactly what you're just saying, my hope is that we could create a society in which people can go to the supermarket and choose well, the entire supermarket would be animal-friendly options, but everything in their basket would be the same as it is right now. Yeah. Now, of course, that's the kind of extreme, which you know is not necessarily two years away or anything. As many of your listeners will know, we know we're now in a position where in vitro meat is available for sale in Singapore. You can get it in Israel as well. It's not mm. yet here in the UK, sadly. We're also in the position, this has been less publicised, but I think it's just as important and just as interesting. Clean milk or cell cultured milk is available in uh, the United States. You can mm. buy ice cream uh, made with milk proteins that were never inside a cow. And there's a group of companies here in Europe racing to produce the same stuff. So this is exciting. This offers the opportunity for having a kind of animal rights system where there's still space for people using animals in the way they currently use them, but in a respectful way. So I think that those sort of things, when I first started talking about this, I talked about it in the form of activism. That was exactly my point. Let's, make, mm. let's use this as effective activism. But I now actually think that more than that, this isn't just to use the jargon of political philosophers, a non-ideal solution. Our ideal theory should also have a food system in which these products are available. Yeah. And I think we need to do more and more of that, thinking about what that future world is going to be, partly because optimistically, I think we're getting, we're moving towards it more quickly. So as we're starting to think about what those alternative products are on their availability, and we're thinking about what the practical nature of a transition might be from our current agricultural systems, for example, and fishing systems. I think, you know, the responsibility is on us to get much more specific and programmatic about how those mm. things are actually going to play out. It's not just enough anymore to say, end animal farming and fishing. We, we need to go, okay, how and how are we going to make this happen in a way that's compassionate to the many people involved in those industries as well. And, and in a way, that's why there's, there's an enormous overlap, of course, between ethical veganism and a sentientist point of view, partly because most ethical vegans are motivated by suffering and suffering is the, the capacity to experience suffering is what sentience is. But again, around the edge cases, it, there are slight differences because veganism uses the term animal and sentientism mm -hmm. focuses on the capacity to suffer. And again, the overlap is absolutely enormous. You look at the animals we farm and fish today, they're sentient beings and no one's really going to spend much time arguing about whether a sea sponge is sentient or not because they don't have a nervous system, but not many people want to eat them. So there are some edge cases, but I think that's partly why I quite like this framing of sentientism because it focuses on what matters morally. And what matters morally to me is not whether something's an animal or not. It focuses on yeah. does it have the capacity to suffer? So on the one hand, that helps clarify some of the edge cases. Again, always a with prudence around what types of entities might be able to suffer. But it also opens us up even into the sci-fi world to some weirder stuff around artificial sentience and mm. you know, even alien sentience as well, right? Who, who knows, there might be possible to have non-biological substrate entities that uh, you know, have experiences as well. And many people, including myself, focused on the sort of sentientist agenda, are worried that's a bit of intellectual distraction given the trillions of obvious biological sentience that suffer in their millions. But philosophically and potentially in the coming decades, that's going to be an interesting topic too. I think that the you mentioned sponges, and I agree with you, no, nobody's eating sponges as far as I know, but there are other cases w w uh, where people are eating these animals. Yeah. So oysters is my go-to example. them in other ways. Yeah. Of course, yeah. So oysters is one of my go-to examples, which of course are part of uh, many cuisines. Jellyfish are another. Now, you and I have probably never eaten jellyfish, but it is actually part of a number of East Asian cuisines. Mm. And I know that there have been some proposals to, to eat more and more jellyfish. But then you talk about the expansion of insect farming. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that insects are not sentient, but neither am I going to sit here and say that they are sentient. Yeah. We just don't know. But then we get the interesting ethical question about how we treat this, this uncertainty. So yeah. you say sentientism, naturalism has got to be about humility. And I think it has got to be. And, and yeah. so... We can't go around declaring with certainty that sentience exists or doesn't exist when we're not sure. But yes. in the real world, we then need to know how to act in relation to these beings, including beings who, number one, lots of people might want to eat. And number two, lots of people might rely on for a living. Yeah. Right. So it is it's got to be a high bar to say to someone, you cannot do that thing that is central to your life. And of course, so I'm, I'm a believer in animal rights and we might get in a second to this issue of rights versus yeah. utility and all the rest of it. But 
I believe that animals have rights or sentient animals have rights. And yeah. I believe that is easily a high enough bar to stop people doing all kinds of things to them. So I think the fact that pigs have rights is enough to say to the overwhelming majority of pig farmers, no, you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. Now, there might be some room for something like pig farming where their rights, the rights of the pigs are respected. That's what I'm talking about with these edge cases. Yeah. You know, we might need to keep a few pigs alive in order to harvest cells to create in vitro meat. Fascinating, really interesting questions, something that needs work. And I would say it's the work I'm doing. However, I am not convinced that it's so the point is, it's a high bar to say to someone, you can't do that anymore when this is central to your life. And so we need to be very careful about saying something like, look, there's a chance oysters might be sentient. Therefore, you all you people who rely on f oyster farming for a living, you're out of a job. Mm. That's a big thing to say, right? Especially in a kind of liberal uh, society. Yeah. If, maybe if we were in a kind of more centrally planned society in which these people would just be assigned to some other job, which is certainly not what I'm proposing, then that might be more doable. But in a liberal society, we've got to be very careful about these things. We shouldn't be using the coercive power of the state, which is ultimately what I'm concerned with when I'm talking about animal rights, unless we are quite sure that injustice is taking place. So yeah. anyways, that's a very long way of saying that these edge cases require attention and we need to be careful. I agree. And, uh, and I think that's, you make an important point that on, in the same way as we were talking about epistemic humility and uncertainty, mm. right? You, you don't know something 100% because that's dogma and you've stopped thinking. And, but you also don't give up completely and go to some sort of nihilistic, solipsistic view where you say it's impossible to know anything. Right? Mm. You can probabilistically hold the belief that is enough imperfectly to take actions. But the same is true on the moral side as well. As you say, I think having a moral uncertainty and a moral humility is important as well. And it's the same trade-off. If you're 100% certain, again, you're trapped in dogma. If you've given up completely, you've just gone to either a relativistic or a completely amoral stance. Mm. Probabilistic beliefs are still good enough. They have to be good enough for us to take decisions. We might make mistakes, but if we're you know, prudent and cautious and give the benefit of the doubt, hopefully we'll make less mistakes than we might otherwise do. And you make that important point in that we... And if, this is a difficult thing uh, as part of the animal advocacy movement and the vegan movement as well, because we see the injustice and the horror of animal farming and fishing. And that can actually lead many people to have a very negative cast about humans. And yeah. that's partly what I'm trying to reset in sentientism as well in an amateurish way is to remind everyone that all human beings are animals and sentient animals as well. And every human warrants compassion too. So in the same way as it's not a single issue thing about non-human animals, it's, it has deep implications for human ethics as well. And you talked about some of the topics earlier on, you can take a sentientist approach and apply it to many areas of human ethics as well. Mm -hmm. Rejecting discrimination, thinking about the you know maybe degrees or starting points for sentience and, and using it in that context but it's but it's also important as we're thinking about trade-offs as we shift towards a way of operating that is more ethical towards non-humans as well because so many humans as you say are bound up in ways of working industries living cultures that are embedded in these things that cause harm to sentience and we need to have some form of just transition and a way of working through those solutions to hopefully help those people find a way of living and operating that causes less harm or balancing in a different way. But th I guess that links on to one of the other topics you, I was keen to talk about with you, and you hinted at they're already talking about the rights for utility. So the history of the term sentientism is quite interesting. You and I have discussed that as well. So it was, mm. apart from that really weird, obscure mention, I think the first time it was used but in serious terms was by John Rodman almost to criticise Singer and Ryder and say, this is just another form of discrimination in a way because you're discriminating against non-sentient entities. And Singer and Ryder, I think, used it in an explicitly naturalistic context originally, but over time it became somewhat synonymous with sentiocentrism in that sort of spectrum from anthropocentrism, sentiocentrism or pathocentrism, biocentrism and ecocentrism. So one thing I've been trying to do with this sort of popular idea of sentientism is to want to say, look, let's, like secular humanism does, also have a much more broadly naturalistic stance that says we mm. should use evidence and reason and a naturalistic approach in all domains of knowledge, not just when we're thinking about sentience. But the other thing that I've been suggesting we do with it, where Singer, for example, obviously went down a utilitarian path and Richard Ryder went down again, a, uh, his path of painism, which was trying to resolve yeah. the distinction between utilitarianism and Reagan's rights view and finding a, trying to find a middle ground that privileged suffering reduction over flourishing. I've suggested that in the way we frame sentientism now, we actually make it more philosophically pluralistic than that. We don't follow either any of those people down those paths. We just say, one, it's a commitment to a naturalistic way of thinking about what's real. Um, and two, it's just how we set 
our moral considerability mm-hmm. and we do that based on sentience but beyond that there's a whole world of philosophical intrigue about trade-offs and trolley problems and all of the really difficult work of philosophy that i think um, is fascinating but to me it seems like the single most important thing is that we don't exclude any being that's capable of suffering so i'm almost suggesting it's like a frame as a really pluralistic but solid baseline but that leaves space on top of that for utilitarian or consequentialist yeah. approaches rights approaches a cause guardian sort of kantian approach the long list goes on so it'll be interesting to know your thoughts on one whether that sort of pluralistic approach makes sense but two what's your view of the right flavor of ethical system or a blend of ethical systems that could sit on top of that sentiocentric yeah. compassion I think that this is absolutely right, and this is the right question to ask. It strikes me that both in the sentientist community and in the broader kind of animal activist community, utilitarian views can predominate. I think that's yeah. partly the influence of Singer, but it might be other things as well. For example, I know that some of my colleagues, when they find they hear about my work on animals before they hear about other things, and then they assume I'm a utilitarian. Yeah, uh, I've never been a utilitarian. I've never really identified as a utilitarian. I wonder if part of that is because. In a sense, by talking about sentience and the capacity to sentience being the thing that matters, that in a sense, that is a consequence of sorts, right? If I am suffering, that's a consequence. So if not utilitarian, it feels consequentialist, but as well as the association with Singer. I, yeah, I understand what you mean. I guess I would say that in that extremely broad sense, yeah, I am yeah. consequentialist, but I think it'd be, yeah. it'd be hard not to be. And yeah. I guess, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm concerned with what happens in response to my actions. But then I think everyone, except for some very strange Kantians, by which I might mean just Kant himself. Yes. Uh, yeah. seems you might to be the only that. one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even um, deontologists think their rules are good because, in a sense, they delivered good consequences in the end. Sometimes. I think the the rules have got to pay attention to what actually happens. But the consequentialism, sorry, deontological or rule-based systems are not always going to be justified on the the claim that they lead to the best consequences. They are sometimes, but then I think they will devolve into consequentialism. And that's fine. That's a view that some people have. But I think what the important thing is, the important thing to note is that a lot of major animal rights theories have got this sentientist flavour, right? If you take Gary Francione's yeah. abolitionism, for example, he has this paper, Taking Sentience Seriously. He certainly seems to be in the sentientist mould and he's not consequentialist. Yeah. Or if you take work that's been extremely influential on me, Sue Donaldson and Wilkin the Zoopolis, yeah. though they perhaps don't use the language, they seem to be sentientists as well. Yeah. And they're definitely coming from a kind of rights-based perspective. So I think that sentientism is certainly compatible with utilitarianism, certainly compatible with rights-based theory, certainly potentially compatible with other kinds of theories. But I guess one thing to note as well is that I'm a political philosopher, perhaps more than a moral philosopher. Mm. Uh, I call myself an ethicist to broadly capture both. Yeah. But I suppose in some ways my work in political philosophy would be what well, people would be more likely to associate political philosophy with me. Anyway, what I think is important to mention is that sentientism and animal activism don't need to be tied up in any particular political theory either. Yeah. So just, I think that often it is assumed that animal activists must be utilitarians. I think it's often assumed that animal activists must be firmly on the left of the yeah. spectrum when they don't have to be, right? Now, I want to put forward a caveat because I think some people might hear alarm bells ringing now. What I'm not saying is, oh, we need to be going and be friends with racists who are animal activists. Or (laughs) it's all right to be sexist as long as you're vegan. Those are not the things I'm saying at all, right? There are, of course, certain perspectives that, as you quite rightly say, from a sentientist perspective, have to be ruled out because they don't involve basic respect for other sentient beings, because of course, humans are sentient beings as well, or at least many humans are. However, that still leaves a very broad range of perspectives. So my own work comes quite firmly from a liberal perspective. Some people might say liberal, some people might say left liberal. I don't know how easily those terms necessarily translate. As one of my colleagues said, if I'm a right winger, I'm not a very typical right winger. <laughs> Let's put it like that. But then, of course, sentientists do come from a kind of very social democratic perspective. They maybe come from a Marxist perspective. I don't know mm. how compatible Marxism would be. Marxism brings with it some interesting consequences. But then, of course, we could go to the other end of the spectrum. So I've done a lot of work on Robert Nozick, 
who many of your listeners might know is a very well-known libertarian political philosopher. Yeah. Now, libertarianism is a kind of minarchist view. It's a small government view. The state exists just to protect a few, a small list of basic negative rights. So it's very much a right-wing philosophy. Yeah. Uh, it's got a lot of power in the states, not so much here in the UK, although you will find libertarians in a few of the political. The point I'm making is, Nozick was a vegetarian. I've seen it joked that Nozick made more vegetarians than libertarians. So actually his, <laughs> his quick arguments about vegetarianism have perhaps been more influential than his much longer arguments about libertarianism. But he, I don't know if we'll call him a sentientist. He's a sentientist in a kind of broad sense that mm. we just bring on, bring in some, it's not just sentience that matters for him, let's put it yeah. like that, though sentience does matter. Yeah. But my point is that I think that one could be a libertarian while still being a sentientist. One could yeah. be a libertarian while still believing quite strongly in animal rights. And even if particular animal activists don't necessarily buy into that, I don't think there's any reason that libertarians should be rejected from the movement, as it were. I don't think there's any reason that sentientism or animal rights should rule out libertarianism uh, prima facie, even while I think it should rule out racism, prima facie, yeah. even while I think it should rule out homophobia, prima facie. Yeah. These are not things that belong in an animal rights movement or a sentientist movement. But beyond that, a broad political and ethical pluralism, I think, does belong in a successful animal rights sentientist movement. I, I, I think you're right. I agree strongly. And uh, I've partly come to that view through my sort of amateurish efforts at sort of building a movement around this. And it's been mm -hmm. fascinating the sheer range of people that these ideas have resonated with, because they, they all share a universal compassion for all sentient beings. They might have different priorities or different ways of trading off different ethical systems, but they all recognize if a being is a reasonable probability of being sentient, it's wrong to needlessly harm them. So they recognize mm -hmm. that, but they just have radically different thoughts about what political system would be the best thing to do in that context. There's libertarians, anarchists, communists and socialists who think that we need to destroy capitalism to enable the way forward. People who are more neoliberal and think that actually if we just tune capitalism to be have more ethics baked into it, then that's the best way to get to a better world. So there's a massive diversity of different approaches, but the motivation is still one of universal compassion and ultimately trying to make the world a better place. But there's a lot of mm. diversity there. And you could say, okay, but if sentientism includes a sort of naturalistic commitment to evidence and reason, doesn't that evidence and reason lead them to all agree with each other? And that would be a breathtakingly naive <laughs> statement because over time, fine, you, you might imagine that a lot of human progress has been partly that sort of process of us roughly, imperfectly, in a really clunky way, coming to common shared agreements about certain things. There is so many different sources of evidence and weights of evidence and perspectives on evidence and ways of reasoning that the diversity of opinions about the best ways of caring about sentient beings are breathtakingly diverse and span the political spectrum. So yeah, that's a fascinating observation. And I think as well that we can agree and disagree at different levels. Yeah. So something to remember is, so let me use my work on Nozick as an example. I don't identify as a libertarian. I used to, incidentally, but I don't anymore. I identify as, as a liberal. However, that doesn't mean that my work on Nozick serves no purpose. Maybe it does, but I'd like to imagine it serves <laughs> some purpose because it can, be a it can do the job of meeting people where they are. And it can yeah. do the job of exposing some tools. We were talking before about finding tools, finding some tools that might be useful for particular problems. So as an academic, I feel I can uncover ideas that are perhaps hidden and they can provide a basis for serving to potentially convince others and exposing new ways of thinking about human-animal relationships. As an activist, and whether we're activists slash academics, whether we're primarily activists or, or what have you, as activists, I think we can meet people where they are. And so that can be a useful reason to engage with ideas that are not our own. But also we can accept that in different circumstances, at different kinds of level of idealization, different ideas can have different value. That's an incredibly choose way of saying something like the following. Not every argument we have is going to be about what the perfect state would look like. Yeah. Those arguments are interesting and worth having, certainly between people who already share some fundamental commitments that they're interesting and worth having. But if we want to change the world for the better, sometimes we have to work within the systems that are already there. So even if we are not liberals, 
The fact that we exist in something like a liberal society means that I think it's worth asking these questions about how liberalism can be more friendly towards animals. Yeah, I agree, so, I agree. And I've, and I've joked before that regardless of what political system you prefer, it will work better if more people are sentientists, because if we have a shared naturalistic commitment to using evidence and reason and we have a more universal compassion, then whether you prefer you know, anarchy, libertarianism, communism, you know, neoliberal capitalism, any of those systems will deliver better outcomes if generally the humans who are the prime actors in these systems have a more generous baseline of compassion and a more naturalistic approach to going about things. So there's almost like a shared, it's almost self-serving, but it almost feels like trying to help people reach that baseline of values and epistemology is almost a, you know, reasonably robust inter intervention to make, even in the face of radical uncertainty about the complexity of the world and other moral systems. It feels like I can't see a downside to naturalism and sentiocentrism combined, but... I agree. And I think on the other side, it's worth saying that I think for many of us, I'll speak for myself then, I'd rather hang out with other sentientists, even if their ethical and political systems are quite different to my own, than people who I might agree with on other ethical and political questions, <laughs> but who are not sentientists. So I think that mm. actually being sentientist gives us more in common than sharing politics. Now, that yeah. might be a naive thing to say. And of course, it's not always going to be that simple. But for someone like me, for whom, you know, for whom the biggest political and ethical issue has got to be the things that we are doing to other animals, mm. perhaps a close second would be the environmental crisis. But the biggest issues have got to be these kind of environmental and, and animal issues. It doesn't really matter to me if the other people who are working against this have slightly different views about how we should order our economy. It doesn't really matter to me if the other people I'm working with have, I don't know, slightly different views about education systems. Now, I've got views on these things. And I'm happy to have those conversations. But I feel that there are some issues that are more important than others. And agreeing on those more fundamental issues, I think, brings people together a lot more. I agree. And I think it's almost a trope to talk about the culture wars and the sort of tone of engagement we have mm. in the public sphere and on social media today, because I think it's probably, we've had echoes of this forever, as long as humans have had the ability to communicate. But it does feel like that sort of tribal instinct to find areas where we disagree is overwhelms much public debate. Whereas I really like the traditional approach of just going back to basics and saying, what are the foundations that we can agree on and we do have in common? And then working from there and rec putting our disagreements in the context of the things that we do recognise. And for me, a shared commitment to evidence and reason and a sentiocentric compassion are, are those two sort of foundation baselines that I think many people who otherwise disagree with each other vehemently can come to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's fascinating to think about that, the value of that pluralism, that diversity of thoughts and approaches, but recognising there's a strong potential common ground. And one of the other interesting things about it is, on the one hand, this sort of starts we're setting strong and it's almost self-evident, right? What better way would there be of developing understanding about the universe except engaging with it honestly and using evidence and reason to try and work out what's real? And if morality outside of a supernatural context is anything, surely it is concern for others. And if you're going to have a concern for the perspectives of others, they have to have a perspective, which is in a sense, another way of saying what sentience is. So it seems yeah. pretty solid, but in a sense, most people on the planet disagree with this because most people on the planet have a strongly supernatural stance on what the ultimate nature of reality is and beliefs that I think are not based on evidence in some situations, proudly not based on evidence, it's faith or some other revealed or supernatural. And on the sentiocentric compassion, Again, the vast majority of people certainly act practically in ways that implies zero moral consideration for certainly farmed animals and most wild animals. They have a sort of conditional compassion, even for many humans, given the challenges of discrimination. So on the one hand, that looks very frustrating and odd, because something I think is really obvious, nearly everyone disagrees with. But more positively, there is really rich common ground there, because even most of the people who, in a sense, have a supernatural worldview or a worldview that's based on revelation or some other source of knowledge, transcendence or mysticism or magic, still 95% of their days use a naturalistic approach to working out what's real and how to go about their daily lives. So there's a really strong vein of naturalistic commonality spanning all different types of people. And it feels somewhat similar on the sentiocentric compassion because you hinted it before. If you say to someone is needlessly causing harm to your companion 
dog or even to a farmed animal, would that be a, a negative thing to do morally? Nearly everyone will agree with you, right? So it's more about, as you said, the sort of crazy or the cognitive distance or the, or the cultural norms that hold people in place. But there's an enormous potential well of common ground, both on the sort of ethical side and the epistemological side that still gives me a lot of hope that we can make change happen quite quickly. But I've, I've launched into a bloody lecture now. But in the context of all the things you've talked about, and I don't want to drag you on too long because I'm keeping you behind already, given everything we've talked about and that sort of balance between a sort of frustration that we're in such a tiny niche minority of people who care about these things, but also that latent well of potential common ground. Does it leave you feeling optimistic or pessimistic or somewhere in between? And do you think there are other things that other levers we can pull that you haven't already mentioned that we can use to make things better? Yeah, good. I keep well, asking I crazily big questions, sorry. I alternate between optimism and pessimism about these things. So one answer that I, I often come to, and it's up to you to decide whether this is an optimistic or a pessimistic answer, is that change is coming because we have to change. Yeah, We have to change the way we interact with the wider world. And I'm thinking specifically about non-human animals here, but talking about the environment more broadly as well, because without it, we are going to face cataclysm. And COVID-19 has been a dress rehearsal for what's going to come. We've been talking about these health risks associated with animal agriculture for a long time, and people have thought that, you know, we're just um, exaggerating. And COVID-19 has not been nearly as bad as it could have been. And let's talk about the other possibilities, not just zoonotic disease, which is what COVID-19 is, of course, but also antibiotic resistance, global cat catastrophic climate change, topsoil erosion, right? This is another one that people don't talk about as much as perhaps yeah. they should. We've got so many harvests left before we aren't growing food anymore. These are scary things. And all of them tie back in important, crucial, fundamental ways to the way that we interact with animals. So yeah. these things have to change. Otherwise, it's going to be the end of life as we know it. And, so is that I, pessimistic? Is that optimistic? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I, I worry sometimes because I think these things through, again, from an amateur perspective, and it does feel like so many roads lead back to animal agriculture and fishing and the tendrils are powerful indeed, both for humans and for clearly for the uh, farmed animals, but also for wild animals and the environment and yeah. the ecosystem we all share. And I sometimes worry, is this motivated reasoning? Right? Because I see that thing Good. as ethically horrific. So am I just looking for all of these other reasons? And, and so I do try and check myself on that. But it's, it just seems pretty rock solid, right? If you look at every single one of those things you've listed, whether it's deforestation, biodiversity, land use, water use, emissions, pollution, antimicrobial resistance, zoonotic disease, which is 76% of com it comes from that sort of animal agriculture, farming and hunting boundary. The list just goes on. And this is one of my other pet frustrations with the field of philosophy as well. And it seems like most professional philosophers are really drawn into really difficult uh, technical problems that are sometimes quite abstruse and probably based around scenarios that we're unlikely to ever encounter. And I, I sense the intellectual fun there, but often the most important questions actually seem to have really bloody obvious answers. So if we could find a way to move towards the sort of more ethical agricultural systems and so on that you talked about, it would be a win for everybody, right? It's a win. It's not mm. even a trade-off. And we need to work through the transition and do that with compassion. But it just seems like the answers sometimes are glaringly obvious. But humans are weird, right? We, As you've hinted, one thing we're not very good at is thinking about existential risks or catastrophic risks or things that are just around the corner, quite often we need a crisis to actually come and slap us in the face. And, and then sometimes you see human ingenuity and things click into place. And the, the COVID situation, I think, is instructive because while I'm deeply critical of our own governments and many other governments' responses to the crisis, and still am, I see that leading some people to a sort of despair of the ability of humans and human governance and science to respond intelligently to crises. And I, I empathize with that because so much of what we've allowed to happen didn't need to be allowed to happen. It's awful. But on the flip side, if you say, okay, let's not give up on science and governments, <laughs> because imagine how bad it could have been if we didn't have the modern capabilities and modern mm. human capabilities to respond to these things in terms of the human behavior and populations pulling around to suppressed transmission and the development of the vaccine. And in, instead of it being three or four or five million people dead, it could have been a hundred million people dead. Mm. So on the one hand, we should be skeptical and you know, challenge ourselves as humans because sometimes we're bloody awful, even in the face of obvious problems. 
But at the same time, let's not give up because when yeah. a crisis does raise in front of us, we could do some pretty awesome things as well. And I think the imperatives you've laid out, I'm just hoping we can look a little bit further into the future rather than actually having to be in the crisis before we start to take it seriously. Yeah, two two thoughts in response to that. I'm broadly in agreement with you. First thing to say is I think we vegans... Dare I say we vegans? Uh, are quite... Speaking on behalf of all vegans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good luck fine. with that. Good luck. Uh, there is a risk of motivated reasoning. And one that I see quite a lot are assumptions about the health links between a plant-based diet and plant-based diet and the links to health outcomes, mm. right? There Veganism cures kinds... cancer. Exactly. This is a real problem in the vegan community. Yeah. You were sharing an article just the other day about wooganism. And we can talk about these kinds of ideas a lot, but I think that there is a lot of problematic anti-scientific thinking in the, in the vegan community, insofar as there is a vegan community. I'm not sure if there yeah. is. That's a different matter. Anyway, the point I'm making is that people are drawn to this very motivated reasoning because they're inclined to think we this is the right thing to do, so it must solve all problems. And of course it doesn't. Yeah. It solves many problems, or at the very least, it helps with many problems. But there are lots of problems remaining. And I guess this goes back to our previous conversation not, about not forgetting about humans either. So let me talk about food systems again, because it's what I spend a lot of time thinking about. If our food system went vegan overnight, as from what I was just saying, that's not actually what I advocate, because I think that something like cellular agriculture, maybe the farming of non-sentient animals, et cetera, I think there's room mm. for that. But anyways, if our food system went vegan overnight, that wouldn't solve all the injustices in our food system. Far from it. Yeah. Because there are many humans who are exploited by our food system. There are many humans who are left behind by our food system. There are many humans whose control is taken away from them by our food system or who cannot exercise the control that they should be able to exercise over the things that they are putting in their body, the things that they are growing, etc. So there are all kinds of injustices in the food system that veganism either won't touch or, at least, or possibly could exacerbate. Yeah. right? Could yeah. make worse. And we need to remember these things. And I think that's one of the values of talking about sentientism rather than say, I don't know, animalism, which of course yeah. is a word that means all kinds of things. But if we were saying oh, we're all about animals, and you do see this sometimes, people say putting animals first, right? That's problematic. That's Forgetting that humans are animals too, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say about crises, something I wrote for the Vegan Society blog about COVID-19 was... I was quite heartened by our willingness as a social community, a political community, yeah. to effectively drop everything yeah. in response to this crisis. And of course, we're both talking from the UK, where things have really ground to a halt in many places and have done several times. There are people who haven't been to work in a long time. I was saying before we came on, I've not visited my office in about a year. So anyway, we are willing to fundamentally change our life in response to these kinds of crises. And the public willingness to do that is I, I, deeply impressive. Deeply impressive. I agree. Yeah. And that's exciting. Yes. That shows the kind of change that is possible when we are, as communities, motivated. Now, it, we're motivated by self-interest in the case of COVID, or, or at least interest regarding other humans. But there's every reason to be interested in uh, veganism motivated by interest for other humans. When, again, we talk about zoonotic disease, when we talk about uh, pandemic risk, when we talk about antibiotic, when we talk about climate change, right? There are lots of good human-centric reasons to favour veganism. Though, of course, that has to come with the caveat, that, as I was just saying seconds ago, veganism doesn't solve everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Thank you. And your point about wooganism, I think, was really uh, important because that's partly why I've been so keen to make sure that sentientism is framed as something that's naturalistic explicitly, because I don't think compassion is enough, right? I think if you have a sentiocentric compassion that says we care about all sentient beings, even including humans, but you have space for supernatural beliefs, it doesn't have to warp that compassion, but quite often it can do. So as soon as you see that there is some either supernatural entity or it doesn't even have to be supernatural, but it can be seeing a one-party state or a glorious autocratic mm. leader, which I'd also agree, say, is some way like supernatural. You're believing they're more important than other humans because of what, right? There's no real reason there, right? And as soon as you see something is more important than the suffering and death of sentient beings, you tend to end up with quite a lot of suffering and death of sentient beings. So there's a risk mm. that things get promoted above the importance of sentient beings. There's also a danger with, I guess, a non-naturalistic way of thinking that you can have, to my mind, some arbitrary moral rules and ethics that can 
justify causing harm to suffering beings. So there's the classic story at the heart of many of the Abrahamic religions that Isaac is asked to kill his own son. And if he'd gone ahead with it, that would have been seen as ethically correct. Even though he had compassion for his son, he still would have done it for a... So there's a dangerous example of how your compassion can be warped or can get conditional if you believe the wrong things. But more to your point, there's a third danger, which is that if you don't take a naturalistic approach, and there's a real risk you just don't understand reality. So you're going to be much less effective, right? So if you do think that veganism cause, cures cancer or that you think there are vaccines cause autism or whatever it is, right? If You can be universally compassionate for all sentient beings, but if you believe stuff that doesn't correspond with reality, you're still going to leave space for awful things to happen. So that's partly why you know, I've been quite keen to keep this as a naturalistic thing and a sentient-centric thing, not just about the compassion, because I don't think compassion by itself is enough, but... Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just tell you very quickly an anecdote. I was speaking at a vegan fair years ago now. But anyway, I was speaking at this vegan fair and I was talking about the work of the Research Advisory Committee of the Vegan Society. And I was saying one of the reasons I think it's really important that they have this Research Advisory Committee is stamping out the risk of embracing nonsense in the vegan community insofar as there is a vegan community. And I became acutely aware as I was stood there speaking that Outside the room where I was speaking were stalls stalls selling crystals and tarot, which for some reason find their way into uh, vegan fairs. Now, if you want to collect crystals, if you want to play with tarot cards, that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Knock yourself out. Exactly. This might be a fun thing to do. But don't Um, stop taking the meds at the same time. (laughs) Don't stop taking the meds and don't start thinking that you can tell the future or learn things about people through these mystical powers would be the thing to say. And I guess don't wrap it up with veganism. This isn't something to do with veganism. This isn't related to veganism. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Thank you. And it's been a fascinating, wide ranging conversation and all of your work is just um, so relevant. I've been lapping it all up from my amateur point of view. So thank you so much for spending time laying it all out for us. What's the best way of people following you, learning about your work? And don't forget to plug your own podcast (laughs) that you're co-hosting with Siobhan. Yes. So in terms of finding out about me, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Josh L. Milburn. That's a purely professional Twitter account. So I don't get into Twitter spats, but uh, if you want to try and provoke me, knock yourself yeah, out. Yeah, let's so try and tempt. I have an Instagram profile, which is a kind of public one. I post lots of pictures of my vegetables, but and that's at a vegan philosopher. It's interesting. I, I use the word vegan in there. I've been reflecting on that recently. So those are places to reach out to me. You can find out a bit more about my work on my academia.edu profile or on my website. You can find drafts of all my papers there. Or if you want to access my published work, just drop me an email and I'm happy to send you send you copies of it. I, yes, and I would very much like to mention the podcast I do, which is called Knowing Animals. So this was founded by Siobhan O'Sullivan years ago, I think 2015. Now, Siobhan O'Sullivan is an Australian political scientist, and she's sadly very ill at the moment. And so I've taken over the podcast for the foreseeable future. But it's a podcast not unlike this one, I suppose. It focuses on interviewing academics in the animal studies space. So this includes people in law and philosophy and sociology and anthropology and all sorts of different spaces. And we talk about their research. So we focus on a particular piece of their recent published work. Uh, and then we, we also ask some broader questions about the field of animal studies and about the role of academics in animal studies, which is topics very close to my heart. So Not every episode is going to be for everyone. I appreciate that because people are going to have their own particular interests. But I think there'll be at least some episodes for everybody. And of course, there are some people who are loyal listeners and listen every week. So thanks, guys. (laughs) Yeah, well, I am one of them. It's a brilliant listen. So uh, thank you. Thanks for running it and send our love to Siobhan too. Cool. Thank you again for spending so much time with me today. It's been a real uh, pleasure to talk to you. And again, it's great to have you in our Facebook group and on our I'm a Sentientist wall as well. Maybe it'll inspire (laughs) a few more people to join us. And yeah, our conversation here hopefully has nudged a few more of those 7.7 billion people towards a more compassionate, (laughs) rational way of thinking and thereby solving. One at a time. That's all we can do. Exactly. And thereby solving all the world's problems. So (laughs) many of the world's problems. (laughs) Thank you so much, Josh. Take care, mate. Great. See you soon. Bye.